And welcome to episode 364 of Geek Town Radio. It's our last episode of 2022, and I have with me to infinity and beyond. Matt, how are you doing? I'm very good, David. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. Yes. So uh, we've got this we're doing today, and then we've got your last podcast tomorrow, and then Christmas. So yes, <laughs> uh, yeah. Before we get to that, what have you been doing the last week or so? Busy weekend wrapping up some podcasts and then actually watching TV shows because I haven't watched a ton in the last two weeks, but I decided to watch some new stuff yesterday. Watch the first episode. I've only watched the first episode of uh, Harry and Meghan. I think there's six of them out now. Yes, Volume there are. two came out as well. So this has uh, been an interesting journey <laughs> with, with Harry and Meghan. I'm sure Piers Morgan could tell you all about it and, you know, all, yes. all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I won't get into the Piers Morgan thing here, but um, yeah, the first episode kind of goes a bit more into Princess Diana. It's interesting because when I think of a documentary like this and I think, okay, this is going to reveal new things to me, even though it did try to sort of do that and some of the information was new, I wasn't surprised by yes. anything that was revealed because whether it was sort of one end of the scale or the other, I was like, yeah, I totally buy that that happened. I buy that that happened. The reason I'm so sort of like, I was so clicked into it and so sort of thought like, yes, that's, that likely would have happened is because of how the British media and the British press act yeah. towards people, not just towards foreigners and women and people of colour, which obviously is where Meghan fits into the situation. Because they talk about, you know, like Harry's childhood and things like that. Obviously, Meghan wasn't mm -hmm. there at that point. But even as far as like the paparazzi around Harry and uh, William and Diana and how sort of invasive it was, and it gets into something that I, I'm very glad it got into, which is kind of questioning the purpose of the royal family and the sort of like wait why are these people living these luxurious <laughs> lives and, and these sorts of things and I was sitting there going yeah I'd like to know a bit more about that as well and I'm, I'm glad they touched upon that in the first episode uh, I have no idea what happens in the other ones I've heard like bits and pieces and stuff like that yeah. but so that's like the Harry side of things there's the Meghan side of things as well where it talks about like how she and he as well thought that they had to you know date in secret and you, you understand why you know public perception and all this kind of stuff and like they go over the moment of like the, the moment that the tabloids and the press find out that they're dating and it just completely explodes both of their lives mm -hmm. and you can kind of see at least the perception that I got from Harry was he noticed and realized and opened his eyes up to the public and everything after his like mother had died and like how the treatment of the royal family went from there and specifically the, the children and stuff and like cameras constantly in their face and there's a bit as well where Diana sort of says like I never knew when a lens was going to be pointed at me like whether it be stepping out the front door or just just doing anything really mm -hmm. and how how invasive that was I found it very very interesting but I wasn't surprised that nothing in there surprised me because I I kind of had an idea in my head of like everything that I've seen and read over the last what three four five years what well, however long this has been going on and started the documentary and had an idea in my mind of how this story had all gone and it kind of at least in this first episode has gone the way that I thought it had the number one problem that you have here, because there's two different elements. One is the treatment of Harry, obviously, as a, as a British white guy, and then the treatment of Meghan as a foreign black woman. Mm -hmm. And those two sets of people are treated differently. Even the first episode goes over that as well. And some people have kind of wondered about how the British press handles stuff in newspapers and the vile things that are written in newspapers and things like that. The thing that some people don't quite maybe understand is it isn't just towards Megan and, and, and people like that. Like I've seen this happen to footballers. I've seen this happen to yeah. celebrities, lots and lots of different types of people. And most of them are either black people or foreign people. Um, I mean, there was a player who played for Man United. He doesn't anymore called Paul Pogba. And he was a black French player. Yeah. Um, like the, the things that were said about him for years. And again, it's in that typical formula and format of how the British press talk about foreign people. And it's not nice at all. Um, 
Uh, there was some stuff over the weekend. I won't go over it here, but there was some stuff over the weekend about Jeremy Clarkson as well and what he said yes, about um, Meghan yeah. Markle, which was which was just horrible. And some people questioned like, okay, why did this get? I think it was in the Sun or something like that. Yeah, I was like, why did this get published in the Sun? There's so many times you go through British press and British reporting and newspapers and be like, why is this thing in it? Why is that thing in it? This thing's horrible. Why is it in a newspaper? And I'm fully on board with agreeing of why is the British press allowed to get away with talking about people like this and Megan is another one of those mm -hmm. and you kind of see through Harry's side as well in his first episode and I'm, I'm going to watch more of it of him sort of saying like I saw what happened to my mum mm -hmm. and I want to protect not the exact same thing but similar things happening to, yeah. to Megan which you completely totally understand there were some nice moments of it as well like them starting dating and things like that so there, there were some nice parts to it as well which was good what do you think of this whole situation well I haven't actually watched any of the series yet but my feeling about the whole situation has always been that I entirely got where Harry was coming from you know I mean I was mm. old enough to remember the whole Diana thing when it happened and I can entirely understand that he saw Megan being harassed in the same way that his mother was and thought nope I'm not doing this and he is an heir to the throne but he's about fifth in line at this point because he's behind all of William's family so he's not that important mm -hmm. as a royal so I think the palace handled it awfully I entirely understand yeah. why they decided to get away and said no we're going to move to America we're going to stop our, our royal duties the palace at that point should have just turned around and said okay you know we're sorry to see you go but we entirely understand why go live your lives and had they done that there wouldn't have been such a huge I mean there would have the press would have got hold of it and made things out of it but it wouldn't have been as huge an issue as it's turned out to be and it's turned into this rift between them and the palace and I just think that's on the palace's side you know oh, they, yeah. they really could have handled this a lot better and just let them get on with their lives you know I think Megan was maybe a little naive in not understanding exactly what she was getting into I think there probably was something on her part of saying well I'm an actress I know what paparazzi are like but I mean paparazzi for the the royal family are an entirely different level so mm. but again she falls in love with the guy and this is something that comes with it i think some of the press particularly for megan has been absolutely abhorrent and people are going after them saying oh well they took money for this well yes they still need to earn money so of course they did and yes the documentary itself is going to have a certain amount of bias because they are in control of it there is that as well and they also know that the palace because of the rules of the palace will not likely respond in any way yeah it says that the start the royal family declined to comment and i chuckled yeah, a little bit because the royal family don't comment on things and then i also get that as well because if the royal family start to comment on everything it then becomes more political issue because if they start speaking out on things then they'll get laid into for that mm. the principle of the royal family has always been to be sort of seen and not heard you know so there are various things going on here and it's just a mess but ultimately i think when they made the decision to leave it was the palace that kind of messed that up and there was a better way to handle that and as I say, the reasons for them to leave seem to be a lot of it to do with the paparazzi and them leaving then caused all the other fallout with the royal family. So mm. it's just a mess and it should have been a lot easier to do than what actually happened. So I don't know whether I'm going to watch the documentary. I mean, I've seen bits and pieces of it because it's been all over the news, but the press also had a go about the fact that the trailer used clips that weren't actually of them. I think one of them was from a Katie Price trial or something. Thing. And I don't know whether that's on Harry and Meghan specifically, because people use stock image clips, and that's probably what that was. It was somebody looked up a sort of paparazzi crowd stock image clip to well, represent... Well, the same thing happened to them anyway, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the problem with doing that is it then gives a window of opportunity for the paparazzi to go, oh, well, we were never like that with them. And it's like, well, I don't believe you. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know? yeah. Certainly. But no, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word, but I thought it was insightful, but not insightful, but not surprising yeah. as well. And I'm uh, curious to check out more. So, mm -hmm. and it's a limited series, obviously you can't have 10 seasons of this. No, <laughs> so. of course.
Yes. All right. The other thing I watched, it's also in Netflix, uh, is Wednesday, which is the new uh, Adams Family series, which focuses on Wednesday, who is the daughter of the family, played by Jenny Ortega, who's made quite a big splash in uh, 2022. She was in A24's X. She was one of those characters. A24's X doesn't really have a main character. It's a group of yeah. young adult people. Uh, and then she was in Scream, where she was sort of the main character as well. That's the um, revival of Scream, if you want to call it that. It's not a reboot. It's a sort of sequel revival thing. And yeah, she's in this as well. I don't think I've ever even said the words Adam's family on a podcast before. <laughs> it's not something I dislike. It's not something I like. It's just I'd never just gravitated towards it. I never sort of pressed play on anything to do with the Adam's family. And I remember when this came out, first of all, and uh, I was like, oh, another Adam's family thing. Like, I, I don't need to sort of bother with that because it just isn't my wheelhouse. And then days went by, weeks went by, and I saw clips of things and people talking about the show and the, the dance scene that was... Yes. Uh, which I still haven't watched because I want to watch it in the scene in the show. Yeah, yeah. But there's like separate clips of that. People saying this was really good, really fun. And then there was reports of it like hitting big numbers on Netflix and Jenny Ortega doing really well in the role. I thought, okay, I'll check it out. I really, really enjoyed this this first episode. I think this is a really smart way to kind of modernize and put the Adams family into like a modern 2022 type setting. Yeah. Because the first episode kind of is basically Wednesday's put into a new school and you see how she fits in. The uh, first episode's about an hour long. Jenna does really, really well in this role. This show's got a lot of really good energy towards it. It's one of them shows that kind of, I don't know, like it, it's not sort of sloppy. It's, it's yeah. got like some, some good energy towards it and that sort of thing. Uh, but I thought it did a very good job of the first episode with the pilot. I didn't know like who the Adams family were and that. I've like, I've seen the characters <laughs> wow. before. Um, so, uh, but um, yeah, I just never watched like any shows or films or anything. But this is like a new adaption for it. They do have the other family in there, but they are a little bit more in the background. Like, they'll probably still be seen obviously throughout the, throughout the season, but it will focus more on Wednesday, which I don't know if that's like a better idea than what you used to do, but it feels like a smarter choice to like focus on one of the characters and kind of put her in this situation. So no, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I haven't heard anything about a renewal yet, which is scaring me because we're going to talk about Netflix and yeah. <laughs> some some, uh, some things to do with that in a bit here. But no, I'm going to continue watching it. Hopefully I don't get to like episode five in here that it's been cancelled, like what happened with Bait the Wink Saga. I got about four episodes into season two and then it got cancelled. So I really liked it. I'm going to keep continuing to watch it. Have you seen any of these episodes? What's your history with Adam's family? I haven't got to it yet. It is one thing that I do want to watch. There's a whole ton of stuff on Netflix that I need to try and get through on the break but Wednesday is one that I want to get to I I mean I obviously know the Adams Family because there's been a couple of movies uh they mm -hmm. used to run the old black and white series on sort of Saturday mornings I think or Sunday mornings on channel four so I'm aware of the Adams Family you know they've been around all my life this does seem like a really interesting take on it it's Tim Burton directing it as well and uh the, yes. it's being created by Alfred Goff and Miles Miller and Alfred Goff and Miles Miller might be names that you recognize because they're the people that created small so they've got sort of history of developing existing characters and stuff. They also did Into the Badlands and the Shinara Chronicles and a whole bunch of other things as well. So experienced writing team behind it, really good director. And Tim Burton's also exec producing. It's got Danny Alfman doing the, the music for it, who does a lot of Tim Burton's stuff. It is one that I definitely want to go and see. There's been a lot of positive things behind mm. it as well there have been a lot of positive reviews and stuff it seems to have hit really really well so the, I, I rather suspect that it will get renewed because it's been all over the place it's got a lot of social media traction I know they haven't said anything about renewal yet but I suspect it will get picked back up because it seems to have been quite mm -hmm. popular I think this is one of them ones where they release like 20 seasons of TV shows in a month Five of them hit, and this is one of the five. Yes. I think <laughs> is, is how I would kind of phrase that. And then the other 15 just fall into the abyss and get cancelled. Mm -hmm. um, but I really enjoyed it. So with Harry and Meghan and with Wednesday, those are going to be my sort of ongoing Netflix shows. So that's yeah. very good. Uh, game, A new game I played this week, one of which we put up for the, I think, most anticipated Geek Town Award for uh, yes, 2023. It came out in December. Uh, it came, it? Yeah, I think it came out the day after we recorded or something like that. So yeah. it came out next to Marvel's Midnight Suns. We had Cursed Protocol, went and got it the other day. I played it a bit of over the weekend. I played about the first hour and a half, I would say. Um, this is from, I can't remember if it's like the director or the writers of Dead Space, but it's from people from the old Dead Space yeah. studio, even though Dead Space is getting a, a remake for the first one. I played maybe an hour of the first Dead Space game, but that was a while ago. I think this is quite a good game. 
so far. It's got some, uh, I don't know, it, it sort of has clicked, but it's sort of, it's still in its early sort of stages. I, I know that there's still like, you know, new mechanics and things like that to be introduced. They've done a good job with this of sort of switching up your typical third person action shooter genre. Mm -hmm. For example, right, you'll go into a room and you'll have the usual stuff. You'll have your gun, you'll have this like stun baton thing and you'll have these health injectors. They do this kind of thing where instead of doing quick heals through fighting, you'll sort of have a set piece of a room where you'll have either one slightly more difficult enemy to fight or you'll have a couple of them. And the idea is supposed to be if you get hit a few times during the fight, you don't heal while you're fighting. You sort of clear that room and then you heal because they've deliberately done this like different challenging kind of thing where there's like a full on animation you can't click out of when you're healing. But the, the idea is not supposed to be, oh, I'll quickly like get my character to have a snack or something. It's supposed to be structured a bit differently. So you kind of got that going on. Same with the reload. It, it's supposed to be sort of, OK, you know that you've got so many bullets and if you shoot all of them that you got, the reloading will take a slightly bit longer. So you have to just like think a bit more about what you're doing. They've done some other different things as well with the dodge mechanics. Usually in third person games like this, you'll see an enemy is going to attack you one way and you'll usually press a directional button and then press like circle to, to roll or to dodge or something like that. They got this mechanic where it kind of locks you in to like an auto lock on kind of thing. You don't actually press a button, but it sort of does an animation for that. And then the enemy will specifically swipe at you left or right. And then instead of you pressing a button and moving your analog stick, you move your analog stick in time with where. So if it swipes at you with its right hand across, you sort of dodge to the right side. And then you have to wait for that. Like, There's like a specific window of opportunity and then you start hitting R2 and then you smack the enemy a couple of times and then it will sort of maybe fight back. There's a couple of times as well where it sort of blocked my attacks and then gone to hit me again and you'll kind of dodge out the way and then hit them back. So it's, it's kind of got a bit of a rhythm to it. There was some people online when it came out as kind of said like, hey, why don't you just have a normal dodge mechanic? The thing I'd argue against that is don't we all want developers to look at normal things like that in games and change things up a little bit, push, mm -hmm. put like fresher sort of takes on, OK, this is how you usually dodge. We're not going to completely rewrite the script for it. We're just going to slightly change it to kind of keep you on your toes and to just have a different idea, have out their own take on it. So I was reading about people like really struggling with it and the timing with it. I've had no issue with it so far. You just got to kind of pay attention as to what's going on. The only point where that gets a bit more difficult, because you're locked in a bit to a particular animation, if there's two enemies in the room, you've got to kind of like turn the camera a bit more and really keep an eye on the two of them. But again, the idea is to keep you on, the, on your toes and to really watch what you're doing. I think the game's best aspect so far is probably the atmosphere. There's quite a few times, and this is quite a typical thing for a game to do, but it still does work pretty effectively. You'll be just walking around in this ship or wherever you are, this sort of uh, this area that you're in, and there's vents above you. <laughs> and uh, there was a couple of times where I went, I started attacking an enemy, it ran off and then just jumped up into the vent. And that's where you think, oh God, where, where, where in the vent is this, is this thing going to come out? And I'll be doing sort of a just look around for supplies, see, see where, the, you know, where the door is, and you'll just hear little clunks up above you. And most of the time, something won't jump out and attack you. But they do a very smart thing with the audio where there's these little sort of specifically designed corners of certain areas and you think oh i'll just turn right here and just go and check in this area and they'll have a little they'll have like a little audio cue where you, it will make you think okay i've turned this way and you'll hear an enemy behind you which will make you sort of question what you're doing in that moment which usually nothing does jump out of you but you always think what if something does you know you don't want to be picking something up and then uh, an enemy attacks you so I like it a lot so far. It's just that I'm just very, very early in the game. Have you seen anything of this game at all? Not really. I mean, I, I don't really do FPS things and I don't really do horror games. So it's not my sort of genre, really. But got a good cast for it. It's uh, Justin Elm is the lead in it, who, I mean, people will probably know from the Transformers movies. And he did, was the lead in uh, uh. the NBC show Las Vegas as well. He popped up in Love, Simon, apparently, according to his IMDb. And Jupiter's Legacy. Was oh, the yeah, other thing yeah. he was in quite recently. He's one of the cast. Karen Fakara, I think her name is, who plays the female in The Boys, is another one of the actors in it. Yep. And the other guy is uh, Sam Witwer, who, I mean, has been in a whole bunch of things. He's no stranger oh, yeah. to geek culture, but uh, <laughs> he's the voice of Darth Maul. He's probably the thing he's most known for more recently, but he's been in like Smallville and Battlestar and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's got a really good cast in it and um, seems to be getting pretty decent reviews. Anywhere from six to nine 
pretty much. So, you know, he's in the right end of the uh, scale. Mm. <laughs> Some people often misinterpret a 7 out of 10 as being bad. 7 oh. out of 10 is supposed to be just, this game is good. If you give a game like a 4 out of 10, that's bad. Yeah. Not a 7. And I think some um, people are marking it down because the PC version had some performance issues as well. So Yeah. I've heard that PS5 is the best place to play the game because yeah. of ray tracing and stuff, and that's where I'm playing. But yeah, very good. I just wanted to give a quick mention to Harley Quinn. I am actually two episodes behind because I've been recording so much stuff. I think they're doing a very good job this season of expanding kind of the, obviously the character roster and stuff. They're, they're including the Bat family a lot more. But they're still managing to make Harley Quinn the actual main character. Mm -hmm. I kind of had just like a realization when I was watching an episode yesterday and it was like, okay, there is there is quite a few characters in this, but they're keeping the structure of it very good. And uh, Harley's still the one like driving the plot forward. So I very much enjoyed that so far. Are uh, you still watching Harley Quinn? I'm a bit behind in the moment. I've forgotten it was kind of because it took a bit of a break and then it came back. And yeah, I, that I've, Rick and Morty did, didn't they? Yeah, I've I've. Don't know whether it dropped off my recording, possibly, so I need to go and double check that and go and catch up on both of those. But it means I've got episodes I can binge watch through, which I'm quite mm. looking forward to. So uh, I will definitely be going back to it. And that's what I've been up to. How about yourself? Well, I finished Manifest, which is also on Netflix. It's been a very Netflix heavy week for both of us. I finished Manifest. That's its first 10 episodes of the final season. There's 20 episodes in total. I mean, it's set, effectively, it's two 10 episode seasons because the second half isn't coming till next year. But like what they they did with that i mean it is a straight continuation of the show that was on nbc in the us and sky over here it's just carrying on that story i'm glad they've gone to netflix to actually finish it it's slightly cut down from what it was going to be because it was supposed to be what six seasons i think they said and it was going to be like 16 episode seasons so they have lost some episodes but not as many as they could have done so they were given 20 episodes to finish it off and they've hopefully managed to compress the story down into that there's some reasonably high stakes stuff in it it's a fun little show manifest is the thing about sort of passengers get on a plane disappear return five years later and obviously the world changing around them and everybody's moved on and all that sort of stuff so very much enjoying where they're going with that i'm not going to go into too much detail because it's very difficult to explain where they are with that plot but if you watched it Previously, it is a direct continuation of that story. So hopefully it will finish off next year with a decent conclusion. Has it had like much change since being on Netflix? Like, is there any budget changes or Doesn't anything appear like to that? be, no. I mean, it's... Same, same thing? Yeah. yeah, still filmed it in the same way. Budgetally, it looks pretty much the same. I don't think it's lost anything from it Good. moving from one to the other. It certainly doesn't seem to have gone down in budget in any way. So it's the same quality as it was before. Pretty much just a direct continuation and they're doing a decent job with it so i'm looking forward to seeing how that finishes next year strike trouble blood i finished that as well because that is i may have all gone out now but um it was going out on the bbc but it was all up on iplayer so i just binged my way through it on iplayer another good series of strike i don't know how many more books there are to get through on that but another solid story they're still playing around with the will they won't they thing from the lead characters <laughs> i'm kind of glad with how they're handling that we'll see where that goes if they do come back for another one because we don't know what they're doing with that compelling mystery again i like what they did with this story it's slightly different to some of the others in that it's almost all based around a cold case so there is a lot of going backwards and forwards in time where you get a lot of flashbacks of what happened back in the 1960s i think when the case of this woman's mother disappearing and whether there is a serial killer out there or who is still out there or whether it's something else has gone on and takes them down various different avenues and I really like the writing on that and uh, I think the two leads are great so very much enjoying that Slow Horses I'm also continuing with that it's about halfway through the second season we've got at least two more seasons of that to come again another brilliantly written show I mean out of the two of them Slow Horses is the better show definitely because it's Apple and you've got Apple money and you You've also got Gary Oldman as one of the leads. So, you know, that's been brilliantly compelling. So Horses being the thing that is based around the sort of also-ran department of MI5 and them getting involved in 
this case of an old agent that has died in what they think might be suspicious circumstances. It's sort of been written off as just a natural death, but Gary Oldman's character sort of thinks that it might not be, so he starts to investigate on the side and that opens up a much wider story. So if you haven't caught Slow Horses yet, well worth watching on Apple TV, as is most things on Apple TV, to be honest. They're very yeah. rare they take a misstep. Uh, there is one that they've cancelled this time around, but Slow Horses is already renewed for seasons three and four. I'm very much looking forward to that. And that is based on a book series as well. So there's quite a number of books for that to work through. So I hope they manage to get through all of them because that's been fantastic. Those have been the sort of TV things. And I've had a lot of time dealing with game stuff this week because I had some reviews and interviews to do. Uh, one of the interviews was with Rich Newbold, who is the game director for Jurassic World Evolution 2. They've just released an expansion called the Dominion Malta expansion. So I interviewed him about that. Jurassic World Evolution 2 is basically a park management sim, you building your own Jurassic Park. This adds a bunch more campaign stuff and you are based in Malta. So rather than being like one location, it is a series of islands which you jump between. So there are like four different parks on these islands and you're spending a bit of time plate spinning to make sure that all the parts are sort of still going okay. Really like what they did with the story there. It is based as a prequel to the Jurassic World Dominion movie. It's an original narrative developed by them in conjunction with the uh, filmmakers, as well as having adding this new sort of area. They've added a couple of new dinosaurs, obviously, because they add dinosaurs with every new pack. You've also got a couple of new features like this one brings in the slightly murkier side of Jurassic World with the dinosaur exchange where there are sort of legit places you can get dinosaurs from which are sort of ones that have legitimately got hold of but there's also another organisation which is sort of the criminal underworld where there's dinosaurs that fell off the back of a lorry and uh, you can build up goodwill with each of those factions which opens up more and more options for you as well so there's a new dinosaur dinosaur exchange system which is quite nice because prior to that you had to basically grow all your own dinosaurs from scratch so this gives you a way of being able to kind of go on and just buy the dinosaurs directly when you want to add them to the park rather than having to kind of go through the process of developing your own but it also adds this nice little thing of some of the dealers are a little bit shady and you can go and request I don't know five stegosaurus and having a completely different dinosaur turn up because that's not what they were actually trying to sell you you know so you you've got like these these little hmm. things on there but it's a really really fun game they've added a lot of interesting little expansions it's got some of the original actors from the film coming back to do voices bunch of great new dinosaurs in there as well so yeah really really fun that also from frontier they released the grasslands animal pack for planet zoo which oh, you know i love planet zoo again it's another park management sim they've added in the main wolf the nine banded armadillo the emu the uh, caracal a wallaby the blue wildebeest and the striped hyena in this pack they've also added butterflies in which is a really beautiful little kind of um, they've got a walkthrough exhibit and they've added those in there as well. One of the things they have put in in this pack is there is a new career scenario, which are uh, they, they didn't add them for a very long time. And then the last two packs they've released have both had new career scenarios in. So there's a load more content in there. They've also released their latest free update, which adds guided tours. So you can have tour points around your park. And it's a nice way of being able to sort of get your park guests to go to areas which maybe they weren't going to go into before because it can be sometimes difficult getting them deeper into the park so guided tours are a really nice way of doing that and that's in the free update as well so there's some really good stuff on planet zoo if you like those park management sims and those building games Planet Zoo is much more detailed in the building side of things, whereas Jurassic World has less detail in terms of the building, but you can still create some really, really nice stuff. But a lot of the buildings are prefabricated. It's more about the management of the dinosaurs in that. So uh, if you've got somebody that likes dinosaurs, Jurassic World Evolution 2. If you've got somebody that just likes animals and likes building stuff, you can build some incredible things in Planet Zoo. And uh, both games are really, really good fun. And they're both out with their latest packs now. So, and uh, 
and there are various sales on things like Steam, so worth going to check out both of those. In terms of our own stuff, of course, Geek Town Awards are still running. You can still go to geektown.co.uk forward slash awards and enter there until the 31st of December. There is a huge prize pack for you to win, and there's also a runner-up prize as well, which is a smaller mystery box. Go to geektown.co.uk forward slash awards and tell us what your favourite games and TV shows and films of the last 12 months were and you'll be entered into the prize draw. There is a huge prize package that you can win for that. So go and check that out over at geektown.co.uk forward slash awards. That is everything we've been doing this week. Let's move on to some TV and film news. So we start off the TV and film news with the renewals, cancellations and pickups. We have got a number of cancellations, people sort of killing things off before the end of the year. One of those being Apple. It's a rare S misstep with uh, Apple because it's an S show that didn't actually uh, do particularly well. Uh, Shatteram, Mm. which is Charlie Hunnan's return to TV, that's been cancelled after one season by Apple. Yeah. um, Didn't get around to watching that. I take it you didn't either. So uh, yes, we've been making jokes about how good the shows that start with S have been on Apple. But yes, that seems to be an S show too far for them. So uh, that one isn't coming back for a second season, which is a shame, but it's very rare Apple actually cancel things. In fact, I can't think of another show they have actually cancelled as opposed to actually ended. Mm. Yeah, so Shatter, I'm gone after one season. Netflix have had the hatchet out as well. Blockbuster gone after one season, which I mean, I kind of part of me thinks whether Netflix decided to do that show just so they could cancel it after one season so they could kill Blockbuster twice because of course Netflix were the people that killed Blockbuster in the first place that's gone after one season a lot of the problems that people seem to have with that show was the fact that there was an opportunity there to do it as a sort of thing set in the 90s and have that sort of 90s nostalgia and you could have done it that way and they didn't they set it in modern day and that I think was possibly a mistake did you watch any of it I watched a couple of episodes of it Yeah, and I quite enjoyed it. I mean, it's from the people that did Superstore. And there was comments that I saw about, yeah, it desperately wants to be Superstore, but isn't. And also the fact that I think people were expecting it to be more of a nostalgic thing, and it wasn't. So uh, I I, I watched the first episode and I thought it was very bad. I think that's a shame for that, but uh, that's gone after one season. The one that really upset people, Warrior Nun, cancelled after two seasons. I haven't actually got to the second season because it came out while I was away. And I do want to go and watch the second season, even though it has been canned. But yeah, there was a big fan reaction to that. And I'm surprised because I didn't see much about Warrior Nun online and stuff until it got cancelled. And then there was stuff everywhere about how can Netflix cancel this show? It's great. I mean, the reason Netflix cancelled it was because the algorithm told it to and, you know, all hail the almighty (laughs) algorithm when it comes to Netflix. So, I mean, that will be why. But yeah, that's a real shame because it, Mm. it does seem to have a fan base. It might not be a huge fan base, but it does seem to have a fan base for that. So that's a real shame. I think that's quite sad they've cancelled that show. That was one I was kind of saving for like a Christmas break or whatever. Yeah. Uh, like round about now, but now I'm watching Harry and Meghan on Wednesday instead. Even though I got to the first season late because sometimes that's just what happens. I'm, when, when I first started the first season, I was like, this is really quite good. Mm-hmm. And a bit of a twist on the whole nun thing and everything. And like, that was quite cool. And I was like, okay, first season's ended pretty well. You got some, you know, it, it's got some good stuff going for it. But but uh, yeah, then they decided to get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, it only came out like a month or so ago. So they cancelled that really, really quickly. And I think they needed to give it a bit more time because I think there were people, there was just a lot of TV out at the time. And I think there were people like me and like you that had sort of like, okay, I'm going to save that for a little bit and then binge my way through it. And I think there were quite a lot of people that did that. And Netflix, I think, jumped the gun a bit on that. I think it's one of those that would have found a bit more of an audience had they pushed it a bit more, which of course we know is a problem with Netflix that they don't. Step Up has been cancelled after one season by Stars, so that's not returning. And uh, Dangerous Liaisons has been cancelled by Stars as well, uh, which have previously been renewed for a second season, but they've now decided that they've reversed that and they've decided it can't. I think the problem with Dangerous Liaisons at this point is it's a story that's been done to death and there's been so many different variations of it, of like direct adaptations, modernised adaptations of it. And as a limited series, maybe, but as an ongoing series, 
I didn't really attract me at all. So I'm not surprised that's not coming back. But yeah, the numbers were absolutely abysmal for it. So uh, yes, that's not coming back. Having had no renewals last week, we've now got a ton of them this week. Ghost renewed for a fifth season on the BBC, which I don't think comes as a huge shock to anybody because it's been a Mm -hmm. massive ratings hit that. ITV has renewed McDonnell and Dodds for a fourth season. That's one of their many, many crime duo procedural uh, things. Yeah. The Santa Clauses has been renewed for a second season, so that will be coming back. That's the TV series based on the Tim Allen movies with Tim Allen in the lead role. I'm surprised that's got a second series because I thought that would be a limited thing, but yes. That feels like something I should be watching. I will pick that up at some point. Now we're close to Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a Christmassy show, so I might go and have a look through mm. that, particularly it's now also got- it's renewed. Tim Allen and his Buzz Lightyear. So. Well, exactly. Yes, <laughs> that is true. Yes. That's coming back for a second season. Sort of, which ran on Sky Comedy over here. It's a HBO Max show. That has been renewed for a third season. Lego Masters USA, that's been renewed for a fourth season by Fox. That's ran on Channel 4 over here. Bake Squad, which is one of their baking shows, has been renewed on Netflix for a second season. Quantum Leap has been renewed by NBC for a second season, which seems to be going down particularly well kind of annoyed that hasn't been picked up over here yet and there don't seem to be any signs of Sky running it either I checked with them recently and they said yeah no it's not on any of our lists yet so I mean it's an NBC show it's made by Universal Comcast the parent company of Universal and Sky so you'd sort of think that it would be a natural fit for Sky but then we said that about La Brea and it ended up on Paramount Plus so um, Mm. hopefully that shows up somewhere but TV rights can be a strange thing yes TV rights are a very strange thing hopefully that (laughs) ends up somewhere because I love the original and this seems to have been going down reasonably well so hopefully somebody picks it up next year but uh, Quantum Leap back for a second season The Sex Lives of College Girls which has been running I think they ran it on ITV2 but it's actually running on ITVX that's what it was actually bought for so you can get that on ITVX that's been renewed for a third season it's a HBO Max series and Yellow Jackets has got an early third season renewal by Showtime and that runs on um, Paramount Plus over over here because the Showtime Sky deal has now ended so all the Showtime series now go straight onto Paramount Plus in the UK but mm. um, second season hasn't come out yet I think it comes out early next year but Yellow Jackets has got a third season already in terms of pickups and other news we have got some advanced air dates for January on Disney there is uh, Reservation Dogs season 2 that's coming on the 4th of January there's a animated series called Little Demon which looks like it's going to be quite good fun that's on the 18th of January is set 13 years after being impregnated by the devil who is voiced by Danny DeVito a reluctant mother played by Aubrey Plaza and her antichrist daughter played by Lucy DeVito attempt to live their ordinary life in Delaware but are constantly thwarted by monstrous forces including Satan who yearns for custody of the daughter's soul so that sounds like it's going to be really really fun but uh, 18th of January for that that's an animated series and NCIS season 20 that comes on the 18th of January. No news in the uh, release that I had about NCIS Hawaii Season 2, but there is a crossover. So I presume that's either going to drop on the same day for Season 2 or it's going to be the week after. Otherwise, the crossover is going to be horribly out. But I suspect, seeing as they have both shows, they'll line them up. But I mean, who Mm -hmm. knows? Yeah. The other thing I wanted to update people on was DC because we talked a lot about what went on at DC over the last sort of couple of weeks there's been a few more updates for that one of the claims that we mentioned last week was that Patty Jenkins, the director of Wonder Woman 3, had walked off over creative differences. That Patty responded and sort of said, look, I don't really usually comment on this sort of stuff, but I needed to say something because that was basically rubbish. She didn't walk off over creative differences. She was open to all options. She was told by DC that the film was basically killed and there was nothing she could do to bring it back. So she was like, well, okay then. So it wasn't her that walked off. It was DC that killed it already. And she was told she couldn't do anything about it. So uh, she's back working on Rogue One, apparently, now for the Star Wars movie for Disney. That is is the project she's in development on at the moment. So uh, that clarifies that a little bit. There was then an article in Variety which said James Gunn and Peter Saffron, who were the new leads of DC, 
BBC Studios were exploring the possibility of folding the Reeves Pattinson Batman into their new universe that they're building. Gunn quickly picked up on that and said, look, I love the journalist here. Variety's great, but he needs better sources. This is completely untrue. And uh, if you remember last week, there was a part in that original Hollywood Reporter article that had said that the Reeves Pattinson Batman universe was going to be a separate entity from the rest of the sort of Gun Saffron DC universe, the new one. And it seems that that is going to be the case. So there is going to be a separate Batman universe for the Reeves Pattinson, and there is going to be this new DC universe for Gun Saffron. Somebody then asked the question to James Gunn, so is Batman going to be a big part of the new DCEU going forward, or is it going to be kept for Matt Reeves only? And Gunn said he is a big part of the DCU. So it looks like moving forward, we are going to have two Batman again. We're going to have a Reeves Pattinson Batman, and you're going to have another actor playing Batman within the wider DCU. I mean, that sort of makes sense, I guess, because you can't really do DC without an integrated Batman if you're going to deal with Justice League (laughs) and all that. It doesn't really work, so you've got to have an actor in there to do that. The next question that was asked was, do you intend to make projects about minor characters in your new DC slate, or are you going to focus on the household names before doing that? And he said, we'll focus on the most well-known and some of the lesser-known characters simultaneously. So basically what they did with the MCU, it's going to be a mix of sort of high-level characters and lower level characters as you probably expect so the big thing that came out after we talked about this last week was that henry cavill is out as superman we didn't know exactly what was going to happen we didn't know whether they were going to keep any of the actors around but it seems like they are going for a hard reset gun said peter and i have a dc slate ready to go which we couldn't be more over the moon about we'll be able to share some exciting information about our first projects at the beginning of the new year Amongst those on the slate is Superman. In the initial stages, our story will be focusing the early part of Superman's life, so the character will not be played by Henry Cavill. We just had a great meeting with Henry. We're big fans, and we talked about a number of exciting possibilities to work together in the future. Now, that, in the way that he worded it, seemed to imply that Henry might come back as Superman further down the line. But Henry then posted a social media thing saying, no, I'm out as Superman. It's been a great run. I love the guys. They've got a world to build, and this is just the way things happen. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be coming back in that role. It's possible that they're thinking of using Henry for something else, which if you remember the story last week, there was talk of Jason Momoa not returning as Aquaman, but maybe coming back as Lobo. They've talked to Ben Affleck about not returning as Batman, but possibly directing. So there may be something in there that Henry pops up as something else, whether it's an old world Superman, whether he does come back to that role in that way or whether it's something else entirely, who knows? But it seems like they had a respectful conversation about it. So that's that. I know this is going to be disappointing to you because I know you want to do back. Yeah, I think most people did. You know, in terms of uh, if you look at Man of Steel, where this all started, you can agree or disagree about, you know, Zach's vision, Zach's direction, the writing, the pacing, whatever. But that is a different entity than the actor. We, we've seen a number of times before, whether it be games, shows or films, where you have really good actors in something that can't quite save whatever yeah. it is because the story might not be up to scratch or whatever. We've seen it happen a number of times. There seems to be this weird consensus going around that like, oh no, Zack's version of Superman didn't work, so Henry can't come back. But it's like, no, if you put Henry into a different film, it doesn't have to be directed by Zack, doesn't have to be written by the same people, yeah. doesn't even have to be Man of Steel 2, doesn't have to be any of that. The one thing within Superman fans were asking for, and myself included, was if you want to do like a revival type thing, not a reboot, but a revival, just make sure you've got Henry as the one in the suit. I did a very long podcast the other day going through all these different things about Lobo and about Wonder Woman and HUD reset and everything. None of these things sound like good ideas to me. There's a lot of things I've sort of looked to here and just responded with, okay, why would you do that? One thing I kind of went into a bit was the the Lobo situation. Mm -hmm. If you look at the differences between let's say Aquaman and Black Adam before Jason was in that role Aquaman was looked at as a bit of a joke character like it was like okay you have the Justice League you got Flash and Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman all these cool characters 
and then the guy who talks to fish. That that was the way he yes. used to be spoken about. Regardless of the quality of Joss's Justice League, I think we could agree, like, Jason in that role, again, this is the differences between a person in the role and how good the film actually is, because those are two different things. And he had the whole thing with Cyborg, you know, the, the My Man thing and all that kind of stuff, and they were, like, you know, r- really cool and everything. And then that and Jason popularized the character of Aquaman and made him seem like a better version of the character because yeah. it was. And then you did, was it 2018's Aquaman? And that went on to make a billion dollars. I don't know if it was a specific Aquaman interest, but Jason was very good in that role and people really liked him. So then what you'd then done successfully is popularized a character Mm -hmm. successfully. They then went to do that with Black Adam and Black Adam had no build up, no previous anything. He was just, here he is with the JSA and we don't know if he wants to kill them or be friends with them or whatever. And the film lost $100 million. And I know that you've got like Zazlev has taken over and James has taken over and all that. There's two elements of this. I don't understand why you would want or even be planning a Lobo film at the moment because you, you shouldn't have that. I mean, you could do that in like five years or something or whatever. But what you need to be doing at the moment is solidify, okay, we have this person as Wonder Woman, this person as Superman, and this person as Batman. Work out who and what that is, and then go from there. Instead of being like, oh, should we, should we randomly do a Lobo film? Well, the other reason that doesn't really make sense is, okay, you've now successfully popularized Aquaman with Jason. We've got Aquaman 2 coming out, which Ben was supposed to be in. Apparently his part in that has been cut. And, okay, so if you do an Aquaman 2, we don't know how well that film's going to do yet and whatever. Why would you then look at that and say, okay, what we'll do is we'll then take Jason out of that role and put him into a role of an unknown character. All that as a bundled choice doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, there are a number of things going on here. I mean, I sent you a video a few days ago, which really made me laugh because it was sort of a guy, it was a comedy skit of a DC exec explaining to James Gunn all the things that you can and can't do with your new cinematic universe. And (laughs) it was hilarious. And it does point out all the things that had he directly continued that that way all the problems of molding this new universe now i do sort of agree with you that you could have kept the actors and just said okay this is a new universe we're going to keep all the cast and move them across the problem is that if they want to set superman in an earlier timeline there are people that aren't following all this stuff and are going to say hey henry cavill's back as superman hang on why is he not with lois because if they're going for an earlier point it's probably going to be a version where Lois doesn't know he's Superman or, you know, it's going to be something like that. Uh And if they then bring in a different Batman and it's not Ben or they want to bring in a different Wonder Woman, it's just, it's messy. And I can sort of see why they've gone and said, I'm, sorry that we're losing Henry, but I think a clean break is the best way to to handle this. So I do agree with you in that the actors were great in that role. They were just stuck with not a great story, certainly in the original Justice League movie. The Zack Snyder one was infinitely better. But I also can see from Gunn and Saffron's point of view of saying, okay, this is a complete mess. The best thing we can do is just have a completely clean break, have a new cast come in. We'll find things for the actors to do i mean i think jason's take on aquaman was really good and popularized that character i don't know exactly how you handle that moving forward i did mention last week i mean one of the things that had they decided that they were going to keep jason in that role lobo is a giant physical presence so it could have been more of a thanos situation where it was actually a mocap character that they were actually using for lobo and jason did the mocap for it and was still aquaman that would be one way of doing it i I don't know how they're going to handle that moving forward. And also, I mean, just because they mentioned Lobo doesn't necessarily mean that it's a Lobo movie. It could be Lobo as the main antagonist in a Superman film. That is the other possibility. So I don't know. Until they actually reveal exactly what the plan is and what the films are going to be, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, And I mean, Lobo is a really fun character and I can see Jason doing that incredibly well if that is the case that that is what they are doing with him. And again, James Gunn himself hasn't commented on that. That was something that came out of that THR article and that THR article, Gunn did say some of it's true, some of it's not true, some of it's half true, some of it we haven't decided whether it's true or not. So Mm. we don't know exactly what they were right and wrong about in that article. I mean, like I say, the Batman thing they seem to be right about, James Gunn 
Gunn himself hasn't commented at all on that Lobo bit. One part of the James Gunn thing that he said with the Superman thing, the part of it kind of rubs the wrong way a bit, which is where he said like, hey, Henry's out as Superman, but there might be possibilities in the future. That's too, like you've just gone to a situation where He's been, you know, hasn't had a sequel for 10 years, been in a, you know, basically two films after that, if you discount 2017's Justice League. You then had him return two months ago, him publicly announced he's back two months ago and obviously would have like got clearance for that. And then two months later, you're then saying, oh no, he's out again, but oh, he might come back in it. So it's it's too in and out. It's sort of... Yeah, I mean, it, that is true. And that is unfortunate, but doesn't have anything to do with James Gunn and Peter Safran because all the Black no. Adam stuff happened prior to them stepping mm. into that role. No, it's just the way he said like, oh, he's out, but he might come back in the future. Yeah, but I it's think... It's to make yeah, up your mind. He said, well, we're big fans and we talked about a number of exciting possibilities to work together in the future. So... So mm. he doesn't specifically say him coming back to Superman. As I said, if you believe that article about the Lobo thing, they've talked to Jason about possibly coming back in that role. They've talked to Ben about coming back to direct. So it may be that they're thinking they can use Cavill in a different role of some description. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe Cavill wants to direct and you know, maybe he'll come back in that. I mean, I don't know. Mm. Or it may be that they have a crisis event and they haven't come back as Superman again in something like that. However, don't feel too bad for Henry because... You know, a lot of people were saying, oh, he left The Witcher for this and now he's not got that role and he's not got The Witcher role. He's not coming back to The Witcher. We know that. Don't feel too bad for him because the reason he left The Witcher doesn't seem to have been for Superman. What it was, was a thing that he's been developing with Prime Video. And I think this has been in development for quite a while by the sounds of it. So I suspect this is the reason why he left The Witcher. He's been developing a Warhammer 40k cinematic universe, which is a another huge passion of his. I mean, I've never met an actor that's managed to land roles which he's been so passionate about, you know, because Superman, character they absolutely loved. Because for those of you that don't know that much about Henry Cavill, he is a gigantic nerd. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's, he's an impossibly good looking gigantic gaming nerd. And, you know, he plays like Warhammer. He plays World of Warcraft. Makes PC building videos. Yeah, makes PC building videos. I mean, all this sort of stuff. He is a huge geek. And Warhammer 40k is one thing Thing that he knows extremely well. I mean, he loved the Witcher things. And one of the other reasons that it was said that he left the Witcher was because of the fact that he disagreed with how they were handling the book material. So he will start and exec produce a Warhammer 40,000 cinematic universe for Prime Video. Warhammer 40,000, if you're unaware of this, tabletop war game, it's one of the ones from Games Workshop. It's one of the biggest tabletop war games in the world. Set in a grim darkness of the future, mighty armies clash over countless war-torn worlds and humanity stands alone, beset on all sides by threats of the heretic, the mutant and the alien. There is a huge, rich background history to all this. To go into all that would take forever. I'm sure there are (laughs) YouTube videos that talk a bit more about the whole Warhammer 40,000 world, but it's basically set in a distant future. Big battles, space marines, people in giant armors, all this sort of stuff. I mean, I played this a lot when I was younger. There is a huge, rich history to deal with from here. He actually teamed up with Vertigo and entertainment to secure the IP. The people from Vertigo are exec producing with Cavill as exec producer, along with people from Games Workshop. So the difference between this and The Witcher is he is exec producing this. It means he has some control over it. He has a say in how they handle the material. There is a post that he put up saying, for 30 years, I've dreamed of seeing the Warhammer universe in live action. Now, after 22 years of experience in the industry, I finally feel that I have the skill set and experience to guide a Warhammer cinematic universe to life. Partnering with Natalie Vescuso at Vertigo has been a blessing beyond words. Without her, we might not have found the perfect home at Amazon. And having a home like Amazon will give us the freedom to be true to the massive scope of Warhammer. To all you Warhammer fans out there, I promise to respect this IP that we love. I promise to bring you something familiar and I endeavour to bring you something fantastic that is, as of yet, unseen. So one of the things with that is the fact that he's talking about it being familiar, being something Something that he loves. He is somebody that is going to respect the material and is going to try and make something that works for the fans. As I say, I've never seen somebody that's managed to land so many kind of passion projects one straight after the other. So mm-hmm. um, I'm really happy for him. And this is something that it looks like is going to be 
in his control as well, to a certain extent anyway. Yeah, it's very good for him. You know, it seems like, I mean, you know, it wasn't the case that like I was out of Superman and next day he's in this thing. Obviously, that was just the way the announcements went. But yeah, he's obviously very into all these different things that he does. I'm happy that he's got a, a pretty big role, which is good. He is going to be in the third season of The Witcher, but not the fourth. Uh, that's where Liam Hemsworth is going to come in and take over the role. And we'll see how the show deals with that. But yeah, I agree with you in terms of, you know, if he's going to be an exec producer as well, we'll have more of a say over the direction of certain things which I've read before about him having problems with that on the Witcher I think that was even in some of the earlier seasons as well but um, no very good for him uh, the, the only other role I'd like to possibly see him in it, de- it depends what the James Bond thing wants to do but yeah. to maybe see him as James Bond he is actually Sherlock Holmes as well I don't know how many more yes. of those films are going to do but they, there's a two film series called Nola Holmes which has got Millie Bobby Brown obviously from Stranger Things she's a Nola Holmes and then Henry is, is Sherlock in those two films as well which both of them are, are quite good fun so I don't know if they're going to give him a separate film or follow up with a third one but uh, yeah it's another big role to, to add to his CV as well which is which is good this also I think because people like to see Henry Cavill well doing anything really this will hopefully bring Warhammer a bit more mainstream as well like if, if people see like Henry's doing this and it's like a cool because I think all people would need to know is like it's a cool video game thing and it stars Henry Cavill in the lead well, role uh, yeah, and then not- you know it's, it's on Prime so hopefully that will help to do that as well which would uh, again be very good so yeah, happy for him. Looking forward to seeing what else he does in the future as well as that. So we shall see. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it is video games, but it is also a tabletop game primarily. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where it came from. But there are a huge amount of Warhammer video games, Warhammer 40,000 video games as well. Yeah. I'm really happy that he's landed this. It seems like a huge passion project for him and, you know, should keep him busy for a while. I think that's so, you know, Henry's all good. I think he's probably quite happy. Yes, I'm sure he's disappointed about not coming back as Superman because he loved doing that role. But, you know, he's got, this and that seems to be a big thing for him so that's great moving on to other things we have a new spin-off from mythic quest which i was quite surprised by but i'm very happy about this Mm. so um, mythic quest of course is apple tv plus show it's set in this video game company called mythic quest it's hilariously funny if you've uh, not got apple tv there are offers literally all over the place for apple tv in fact should mention if you're a sky customer go and check the my sky app and go to the Sky VIP section because they're giving away, if you've not tried Apple TV before, they're giving away six months free of Apple TV on that. I think there's an offer on Virgin Media as well. If you go to the UK Airdates page, I actually posted a thing, check in the comments, I actually posted a thing where there's there's a whole bunch of different offers from anything from like one month to six months. I mean, you know, we've talked about Apple TV giving away subscriptions with boxes of cereal and stuff. I mean, it's just ridiculous. (laughs) The amount of places you can get free Apple TV TV subscriptions is insane. It's well worth checking out. They have consistently the best, highest quality, smaller amount of shows, but they're all extremely good quality. But Mythic Quest is one of the things on there. It's a brilliant, brilliant comedy from the people that did It's Always Sunny. And the spin-off is called Mere Mortals. It follows the lives of the employees, players, and fans who are impacted by the game Mythic Quest. It's an extension of the series that takes page out of the acclaimed departure episodes of Mythic Quest. So there's a lot of what we refer to as bottle episodes. They do one or two a season. These are episodes that don't necessarily feature all the main cast. They maybe are something that is back in time, or they just look at one specific element. There is um, a heartbreakingly wonderful episode of uh, Mythic Quest which was done during quarantine where they're all sort of on Zoom calls and stuff and uh, it's so beautiful that episode really pulls at the heartstrings great one-off things so it sounds like they're they're taking that sort of format of taking sort of little vignettes following various different characters the series is being written by Ashley Birch who plays Rachel on the main show who is also a staff writer as well on the show so she's going to be one of the main writers she's also joined by John Howell Harris and Kate McKelney, who I'm presuming is wife or relative of some description to Rob, uh, given that they've got the same last name, who were both writers on the main show. But So those are the three people that are developing it as well. Uh, I think this sounds like it could be quite good. I have no reason to think that this will be bad. There's, yes. there's, there's, there's nothing. <laughs> I don't have anything. 
Uh, it's like with The Last of Us, I look at that and there's there's no reason. But yeah, it's uh, in- interesting to, for, for Apple to try to start doing a spin-off. I mean, this doesn't mean it's going to end up like The Walking Dead and have like six different shows or whatever, but they're a bit more selective with how they do things. Over there, they don't just green light anything. And yeah, if this is going to, you know, have canon towards the main show and, and do other like smaller bottle episodes and stuff. I mean, no matter what Mythic Quest has done during its three seasons, it's done it incredibly well. I like basically all the characters and everything else so yeah be curious to see where this goes and uh you know what happens with the rest of season three but yeah i have no reason to think this will be bad i only have reasons to think this will be good so, yes we'll see so i uh, don't know when that's gonna land but uh, it's called mere mortals a mythic quest season three is currently that's a good name running. yeah it is <laughs> mythic quest season three is currently running on apple tv and uh, as i say th- there are loads of offers around for apple tv so if you've got sky go and check your sky app in the vip section for that well well worth getting and uh, checking out sticking with video game things there is another video game adaptation on the way once again on prime video they've given a series order to an adaptation of god of war this we actually heard initially about back in march that they were circling looking at this but they've actually now picked it up to series is. It comes from Mark Ferguson and Hawk Utsby, I think his name is, who worked on things like Iron Man and Children of Men. They also were the people that developed the Expanse TV series, which was, of course got picked up by uh, Amazon as well. Mm. Rafe Judkins, who worked on The Wheel of Time, is going to be showrunner on it. And it's a co-production between Sony and Amazon, because of course it's with PlayStation Productions, because of course it is a PlayStation game. Mm-hmm. Um, for those of you who don't know, God of War follows Krantos, who is the God of War, who after X Styling himself from the blood-soaked past of ancient Greece, hangs up his weapons forever in the Norse realm of Midgard. When his beloved wife dies, Krantos sets off on a dangerous journey with his estranged son to spread her ashes on the highest peak, his wife's final wish. Krantos soon realises that the journey is an epic quest in disguise, one which will test the bond between father and son and force Krantos to battle new gods and monsters for the fate of the world. That's the setup for it. That's sort of the setup for the first game, basically, isn't it? I think I haven't actually played all the gods of war games but i think all the the first sort of reinvented game anyway because the franchise has been around forever but mm. yes they sort of reinvigorated it didn't they on the ps4 i seem to remember yeah this started on the ps2 with the uh the greek with um, the greek stuff saga. yeah and that, now it's move over to the, to the norse mythology yeah, I think this is a this is a very good idea. I did read some some stuff that they're going to skip the Greek mythology and go to the Norse one, which I think is yes. a mistake. Because even though you don't have to go and play those old PS2 games, there's quite a few of them actually. And there were some ones on on the PSP, which I I did actually randomly play that one for some reason when I was when I was a bit younger. But yeah, the the 28 because it says a 2018 game. It's just called God of War, and then there's God of War Ragnarok, which is the sequel. If you haven't played like the the PS2 games and you don't want to you know get your PS2 out or whatever, you can go and just start with the 20. 18 version because it's kind of a revival thing it keeps the canon of what happened before in the other games you don't really get like flashbacks and stuff but you get a lot of references and you can tell there's a sense of history there which is why they shouldn't skip that and even though yeah you can do things through references and flashbacks if you want this to last a while like if you want this to be a longevity sort of show because this is something you could do for maybe eight or so see this because there's a there's a lot of stuff you could dig into here i mean even just with the the last two games those are like 30 hours each Mm -hmm. or, or something like that so there's a lot you can pull from it would be a mistake if they skipped over the Greek stuff. Plus, it really does show the character development of, of Kratos as well. Even though when you, because I still have issues with Kratos' character in the two newer games, he's just a bit, um, he's a bit Daryl. <laughs> sort of, he grunts a lot and, yeah. you know, he doesn't respond that much to things. And for, for a lead character, it can be a bit frustrating. There's actually a part in God of War Ragnarok where, I won't say who it is, but somebody's talking to Kratos and they're on like a hunt or whatever it is. And that person says something to Kratos and he grunts. And then the person and says, am I supposed to just decipher your grunting, <laughs> which is quite good. <laughs> uh, somebody actually questioned him for a change. But no, in, in, in the two newer games, he, yeah, he's got his son, which is called uh, Atreus. I think this will be something that could suit a TV show, certainly, because it's very sort of action heavy and there's, there is some deep lore and story. This certainly isn't something that you'd want to cram into a two hour film. No. Definitely not. Which might become a problem with Gears of War, because I think Gears, Netflix is doing a Gears of War film, which I, I think they should do that as a TV show. Yeah. Um, I, I really like the Gears of War games. But we'll see how this goes. It'd be interesting to see who they cast as Kratos and certainly Atreus as well and the other characters. 
it was kind of interesting. I immediately read some comments about like, oh, you should, you, should, you shouldn't cast Kratos as a black person, and it's like, um, he's voiced by a black person. <laughs> yes. His name's called Christopher Judge, and he just won the the best performer of yeah at the game was. Plus, Kratos isn't human anyway, so like, you yeah. know, it, it is better like that. But whatever. But uh, wh- wh- whoever they choose, hopefully they're very good for the role. There's been obviously some suggestions thrown out. I think there'll be plenty of names you could have for Kratos. It's Atreus. It's going to be the challenge whenever you go for that because Atreus is supposed to be a younger actor and sometimes finding young not necessarily a child actor but he's like that sort of young teenage sort of age yeah. so we'll see who they who they choose for that again it's going to be the same challenge as like who can play ellie in the last of us yeah so we shall see but yeah it's interesting the, the approach that playstation has taken because i think it's netflix has got gears of war hbo's got the last of us sony did a just an uncharted film i think somebody else has got like gran turismo and stuff it's good that they've taken this approach because they do have some very strong characters that they could uh, mm-hmm. use with it within their own IP. And I like that they haven't just like, hey, 10 year deal with Netflix, everything has to be on there. Yeah. Um, and they can kind of see who does the better and who does worst. Yeah. So, yeah, what do, what do you make of this? Well, I mean, I've not really played the God of War games, but I think I played the first one on the, or the first 2018 game a little bit. I've not played any of the earlier ones. I sort of get the point, you know, it would be nice to do the Greek backstory, but I mean, I get why they're jumping in at this point because I think this is the version of the game that people know with the North mythology and set in Midgard and all that sort of stuff. So Mm. I get why they're starting off here. You either could do some stuff with flashbacks or if this is really successful maybe you do a prequel series I mean maybe you do it that way possibly there are options mm. if you want to you go back to the Greek stuff but with, with what you point out there do you think that's the case that because they've got like Loki and Thor and, that, and those characters that they could lean a bit more on that is that sort of what you mean yeah I think and like you've got Odin and, and that sort of stuff yeah and I think the Viking stuff is possibly a bit more popular than maybe going into the Greek mythology at this point I think the Hercules Viking and Zeus and that I, there's been yeah. quite a lot of Viking shows around, so I think this is a quite mm. a nice sort of twist on that. And, you know, like I say, if this works, maybe you go back and you could do some prequel stuff. It's set in the Greek mythology. If this suddenly becomes a huge hit, you know, maybe you go back or maybe you do it as flashbacks in this. I mean, there are options of what they could do with it. So it's a good team behind it. I mean, I think the the guys, Mark and Hawk, did a really good job with The Expanse. That was a great show. Yeah. So that's a solid team behind it. Um, I mean, and this isn't the only game adaptation they've got coming. They're doing a Fallout thing on uh, Prime Video as well, which is from... Mm. Um, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, the people behind Westworld, that's their other show, as well as The Peripheral, which they're also doing for Prime. So there's lots of sort of video game to film adaptations that are actually seem to be doing a better job of them this time around. (laughs) That's going to be another one to look out for. But yeah, Mm. uh, I I sort of like this. I mean, Christopher Judge, who voices him in the um, video games, is of course Teal'c from uh, Stargate SG-1, is probably where most people know him from, but he's the voice of uh, Grantos in the video game. Whether he get the role, I know they don't usually do that. I mean, he'd be great, but I suspect they'll maybe go for a possibly a, a bigger name as Krentos. I mean, you know, somebody like Dave Batista or somebody like that, maybe they would go for, but... Jason Momoa? Yeah, well, yeah, whether, whether Momoa would do that at this point having just come off the back of C which is kind of a similar role mm-hmm. to this of sort of a not talking very much grunting kind of character uh, you know C was great but whether he would jump into this as well Jason would be great obviously but I don't think he's necessarily big enough either physically big enough you want a sort of real hulking sort of guy for Krantos don't you really but we'll mm. see like I say the casting's going to be interesting for that one see who they actually pick but don't know when that's landing we just know that they've ordered it at the moment so we'll have to wait and see on that that's all the news we've got for this week we're now going to give you some highlights for the well next few weeks on TV <laughs> So as we're coming up to Christmas, we're going to give you highlights right through until the end of the year. We will be back early in the new year with the podcast again, but this will be the last one for 2022. So here are some highlights up until the end of this year. We've got Big Sky Season 3 returning on the 21st of December. That will be back. We've got Jack Ryan returning for its third season. That's on Prime Video. That's on the 21st of December as well. I am very much looking forward to it. The last season. No, it's not the last season. 
season. There is a fourth season coming after this, and then uh, right. there is the Michael Pena led spin off, which is uh, I don't think he's fully confirmed, but they're talking about bringing that in, which will be a continuation of the story. I think his character gets introduced in the fourth season, and then he will be the lead moving forward. It's still based on the same book series, but there's mm-hmm. yeah, he's another well known character from that book series, so they're going to move that forward. But so there is one more season of the main Jack Ryan after this and uh, yes because like you say John Krasinski's rather busy these days yeah Jack Ryan season 3 21st of December on Prime Video Emily in Paris returns for its third season that's on 21st on Netflix 22nd on Netflix you've got Alice in Borderland season 2 landing on Christmas Day you have the Doc Martin special that's going to be the very very last ever episode of Doc Martin that's coming Christmas Day at 9.05 that will be landing on ITV. Also on Christmas Day, you've got The Witcher Blood Origin, which is this limited prequel series, which is sort of the birth of The Witcher in the first place. That's a six episode prequel series that's coming on Christmas Day to Netflix. La Brea season two, the wonderfully bonkers thing about a massive sinkhole opening up in the middle of Los Angeles and falling through into a primeval world. That comes on Boxing Day. That's on Paramount Plus. I'm very much looking forward to that being back. Charlie Cox returns to Netflix and that's in a new show, a limited series called Treason. That's written by the guy who wrote Bridge of Spies. That's on Boxing Day as well. So that I think should be quite good. CSI Vegas, that comes for its second season. That's on the 28th of December at 9pm on Alibi. And then Atlanta returns for its fourth and final season. That's on the 28th of December. That's Donald Glover's series. Mm. Back for one last season. If you're looking for those specials and stuff and other things that are out over Christmas, if you go to geektown.co.uk forward slash Christmas, there's a big list of all the specials, those one-off episodes like the Doc Martin thing, but there's a whole load of those sort of one-off and Christmassy shows and that sort of stuff. So if you're looking for all that sort of thing, rather than fill up the main list, it's in a separate list at geektown.co.uk forward slash Christmas you can find that as well that's all the stuff to keep you going until the new year and then of course there is a load of stuff starting in the new year as well so uh, we're going to be sort of a lot of things to watch around Christmas definitely I have a lot of things to watch and a lot of things to play (laughs) yes I've not even done the Toy Story Disney Dreamlight Valley I've been been saving that so I've got that as well oh yeah I need to go back and play that a bit more yes I I don't know they released some updates for that because I need to go back and uh, yeah they added Stitch they added Buzz and Woody Oh, cool. Uh, they added Scar, and ah. there's probably a whole lot of bones to clear as well. So. Yes. <laughs> and Iron Ingot to, to go and collect. So, yes, I yeah. will have to go and play around with that. In the meantime, if you want to find more of Matt, where can they find you? They can find me over on entertainmenttalk.org or on your favorite podcast platform by searching for the same name for TV, games, films, and main eye podcasts. A few things to note. January 1st is when a month of positive creators comes back, and there's also going to be new episodes of classic reviews. I've been very bit of talk a lot this week because I've been trying to get it all finished before Christmas comes around uh, so that'll be January 1st and then the following Wednesdays that'll be from the 4th onwards so January 1st and then the first Wednesday after that if you don't know what month positive creators is I choose uh, four content creators once per year just to kick off January in a positive way four content creators that make content on you know podcast twitch YouTube that sort of thing and tell you all about them what they do where you can find them and that sort of thing so I'm looking forward to revealing my four choices for that I'll drop a teaser and say one of them is actually a group of people people so um that's, ah. that's something different um in terms of the podcast uh, other stuff of course uh may not i do come back on wednesday but i'll return with the united cast in the new year as well as gaming talk for all that if you want to know about our uh, best and worst of 2022 stuff we're going to be doing that i think tomorrow as well with gray so it'll be me david and gray going through our individual list of best and worst for tv games and films and that's pretty much it you can follow me as well on twitch etalk uk and youtube entertainment talk plays there'll be some other stuff dropping on january 1st as well so check out that but i hope everybody has a very good christmas a good start and an entire good 2023 see you all in the new year yes so lots of stuff over on entertainment talk for matt over there for other people involved on the show you can go and get bex over on twitch.tv forward slash trista bites that's b-y-t-e-s she's been doing uh charity streams for the samaritans i'm not sure 
whether she's still doing them, but certainly go and check out and go and donate for it because that's a really, really good cause. Go and check Bex out over on twitch.tv forward slash Trista Bites, B-Y-T-E-S. So go and check her out over there. And uh, Daryl, you can go to hollywoodnorthnews.net for all those TV series that you love, which are shot in Canada. For us, you can go to the website at geekdown.co.uk throughout the week and see all the latest air date information. If you want to get in touch with your questions or comments, email us on podcast.geektown.co.uk. Leave a message on the website post. Find us at Geek Town on Twitter, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Geek Town, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Geek Town, and on Instagram at Geek Town UK. Don't forget the Geek Town Awards are still running. So that's geektown.co.uk forward slash awards. If you want to get the Christmas shows, that's geektown.co.uk forward slash Christmas. We will still be updating things over the Christmas period, although the main sort of posting will slow down. But have a fabulous Christmas and New Year. We'll see you early in the new year for a new podcast. Thank you, everybody that's been listening this year. It's been wonderful just doing the show and talking to people, and it's just been great. So uh, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Christmas and New Year. We will see you next year. Bye-bye. Goodbye.